All right. Well, thank you guys for being here. Uh, we are thrilled that you made the effort to be here and gave up your Saturday. Let me invite you as well. Uh, if you don't know, obviously, this is our church. Uh, and we have church services every Sunday, uh, like the Bible instructs us to do. And you are all invited to come here tomorrow for church. We'll have potluck right after, so we can send you off with full bellies. And um, we'd love to have you. If you're local and don't have a church, we would love to have you. I know some others if, uh, around us that might be closer to you if you're interested. But uh, with that out of the way, um, we are going to be talking about decisional regeneration, like Ken said. And I don't know how many people are familiar with that term, with that concept. Um, I would say there's more people familiar with the concept not knowing the term or the label for it. But we are saying we would make the argument that that has contributed to rampant apostasy in the church, uh, particularly when it comes to young people coming out of high school, coming out of college, young people in their 20s. Uh, in that demographic in recent years, like Ken said, we have seen massive numbers of people abandoning the faith, abandoning the church, abandoning any meaningful profession of faith. Uh, like you see in these videos, there's people that make professions of faith, but they don't have a whole lot of um, substance behind them in terms of uh, tied to some sort of historic faith, anything along those lines. And we would attribute, well, what we're seeing is decisional regeneration is just very, very prevalent in American churches, and we're seeing this in America. It's promoted in American churches. And we're gonna talk a little bit about where that came from. Let's see if I can get my screen to, my screen is not moving. <laughs> this happens every now and then, it's the worst. I do have a backup that uh, I do not wanna read off my phone. But it was working literally a second ago before I came up here. There we go. We're going to talk about some of the dangers. That, this cord is very finicky. You might just unplug it right there if you want. Um, we're going to talk about what it is, where it came from, and some of the dangers from it. So we'll start with what is decisional regeneration. And I'm hoping if you've raised, been raised in the church, you probably know what regeneration is. That's a very common term. It's being born again, right? Regeneration is being born again. It's an act initiated and completed by the Holy Spirit to change our spiritual nature from dead to alive, spiritually dead to spiritually alive, so that as a result, we will be irresistibly drawn to Christ. We will believe the gospel and we will repent of our sins. That's just the basic understanding of regeneration. That's historic. That's not necessarily uh, individual to us, that's the historic understanding of regeneration. The Holy Spirit does it, the Holy Spirit completes it, he initiates it, and the result is our salvation. Decisional regeneration simply takes that rebirth, that regeneration out of the hands of God in terms of initiating it, and it places it squarely in the hands of man. Regeneration is then considered to be God's response to our decision in allowing him to change us. So sort of like, okay, God, I'll give you the okay. I'll give you the green light. I'll make a decision and then you will therefore regenerate me. It's decisional. It's based on a decision. He's been sort of waiting in the wings, hoping that we would make that decision. And then once we finally do, then he's, he's then ready to proceed with our salvation. So the goal for many churches has become to get decisions for Christ. They call them the decisions for Christ. That's been the goal. That's how they measure their success. How many decisions for Christ have they gotten? That becomes the goal of their evangelism. Get a decision for Christ. It's not to make disciples. It's not to baptize them and teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded us. Like he said in the Great Commission, exactly what he told us to do. It's merely to get people to sometimes walk an aisle or you know, have an altar call, have them come down and profess, make this decision for Christ or to sign a card that says they've done it. Or sometimes they just recite a prayer that the pastor leads them through. And we can rightfully ask, where did decisions for Christ, where did that come from? When, when did it even become a thing? Right? Because you're, you, you're not going to find that verbiage in scripture anywhere. You won't find it in the early church. You won't find it in the medieval church. It's definitely not in the reformational church. And of course, it's like I said, it's nowhere in the Bible. 
decisions for Christ are never mentioned. Nor is anyone commanded to accept Christ. That's not there either. You're never told to ask Jesus into your heart. The constant command of scripture is repent and believe. That's what they say. That's the apostles' message. That's Christ's message. To some, that may appear as a mere semantic difference. I understand that. But behind that difference in verbiage is a significant difference in theology and understanding of what's actually happening. Because what decisional regeneration does is affirm man's ability to do the spiritual good to requ require for salvation. It affirms man's ability to do that. It, it says he can do that entirely on his own prior to being born again. Spiritually dead people can make these decisions for Christ. Prior to have, before you have any spiritual life, you're able to act spiritually. That's what decisional regeneration proposes. Not necessarily formally, but in practice. So it's decisional rebirth. That's what decisional regeneration is. Being deci Deciding to be reborn. And that makes as much sense as decisional birth. It, it makes as much sense as saying a baby is able to decide to be born, which is nonsense, right? No believer decides to be reborn and no, un, no uh, unbeliever decides to be reborn just as no baby decides to be born. It happens to them. Think about Lazarus. Everybody knows the story of Lazarus being raised from the grave, right? Did he decide to be brought back to life? Did he hear the words of Jesus saying, Lazarus, come forth? And he was like, let me think about that. Should I accept Christ's invitation to come out of the grave? Or was he physically dead and had no ability to hear anything at all? Which was it? I think you know the answer to that. He's dead. He can't hear. He can't talk. He can't walk. He can't breathe. His heart's not pumping. His brain has no brain waves. Nothing's functioning because he's dead. And he did not decide to be brought back to life. He passively was brought back to life by Christ. And then once he was brought back to life, his heart started beating and his brain started functioning and his body started acting like a physically alive man because that's what he was. It happened to him. He didn't decide to breathe and decide to let his heart start going. He breathed and walked and talked. And of course, once he did that, he's not going to stay in the grave any longer because dead people, alive people don't live in the grave. That doesn't make any sense. So of course he came out of the grave when Christ says Lazarus come forth. But what happened to him first? He was brought back to life physically. So we, in the same way, analogically, are brought back to life spiritually. We likewise act like spiritually alive men and women once it happens to us. We passively have it happen to us, and then we act spiritually. We believe, we repent, we do good works, we act spiritually, right? That's what spiritual alive people do. And of course, we don't stay in the grave any longer. We don't stay in our sin any longer. We, we don't act like we're spiritually dead if we're spiritually alive, so we come out of the grave. We come out of a life of sin. So this whole mess of confusion can really be pinned down to whether one believes regeneration precedes faith, as scripture teaches, or if faith precedes regeneration, as the American church, I would say, practices or pretends to be true. That order is massively important because if faith precedes regeneration, then being born again turns out to be God's reward for our decision. We make a decision as a spiritually dead person and you are rewarded with rebirth. That's how that would work. It would be owed to us because God says, if you make this decision, then you get this. He would owe it to us and we would decide where it happened, when it happened. And we would basically be controlling the Holy Spirit's action. We could say, Holy Spirit, you can do it now. You can make me be born again now when I decide. You're controlling God, in essence. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus, though, in John 3? The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. He just does it. He does it how he wishes, when he wishes. It would also, if that were true, this idea of, of faith coming before regeneration, it would make faith no longer a gift that God gives to us, 
but instead it makes it a human decision that we produce of our own fallen wills. The right biblical understanding, of course, I would argue, is that faith is a gift. Faith is something granted to us by God. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The grace, the faith, the salvation, it is a gift of God, all of it. Philippians 1, for to you it has been granted, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Believing in him has been granted to you. That means it is a gift, fundamentally. 2 Timothy 2, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to uh, a knowledge of the truth. Repentance and faith are kind of these dual uh, aspects of salvation. They come together with regeneration, but it's granted, something that's granted. John 10, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. The reason they don't believe is because Christ has not made them his sheep. If he made them his sheep, they would believe because that's what comes with it. When he changes you to a sheep from a goat to a sheep, along with that comes faith. It's granted to you. And then 1 John 5, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. I'm going to get a little nerdy on you here because I love that last verse. The verb tenses in there are important. They're clear in affirming exactly what I'm saying about regeneration preceding faith. If it were, if we, if we were going to interpret it overly literally, <clears throat> using the like kind of drawing out the verb tenses there, we could say it this way: all the ones presently believing, everybody here presently believing that Jesus is the Christ, has been previously born of God, and he's saying it in a causative, like because you were born of God, that's why you presently believe. This thing happened to you in the past. As a result, comes your belief. He's literally saying regeneration precedes faith. So that's grammatical proof. That's a little bit nerdy. I know people don't necessarily get into that, but grammatical proof in scripture that existing faith in believers is that they first experienced, they first passively received rebirth, regeneration, a changing of their spiritual state. The only decision going into regeneration is God's sovereign will. It is not ours. It is God's sovereign will. And that goes all the way back to God's election of his people, fundamentally. It does, of course, result in a decision from us. We're not denying that. It's not that none of us make a decision, but we are saying that decision is a result of regeneration, not a cause of regeneration. Like I said, the order is very important. Just like we say, well, good works come from being a Christian, but they don't make you a Christian. If you put good works at the beginning saying that you need these to be saved, then you're a heretic. And that's a false gospel. If you're saying good works come from people that are saved, congratulations, you're orthodox. And that is the gospel. Of course, that's true. So the the order matters. Mixing up results and causes can easily spiral into a fundamental denial of the gospel. So no one is up here saying nobody makes a decision from Christ. We're saying your decision from Christ came from your rebirth. It did not cause you to be born again. It was a result of having been born again. And that really, really matters. And you can probably tell this theological confusion is very much a a direct result of what I would call the Arminianizing of the church. And there's no denying it is inexorably linked to man-centered Arminian theology, sadly. A theology that has drifted from the Reformation, the the soteriology, the anthropology, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of man that we recovered in the Protestant Reformation. And it really did take hold in the 19th century. So it's pretty new on the scene. 19th century, you've probably heard of this pop evangelist is what I would call him. He was a revivalist named Charles Finney. He was around in about the 1820s. was a heartbeat of his ministry. He's sometimes referenced as the father, uh, father of modern revivalism. But the truth about Charles Finney, if you've heard of him, is he was nothing more than a common heretic. And I don't say that lightly. That is not a slur that I call into service against anybody that I don't like. But in his case, it is a simple, undeniable fact. He was not raised in the church. He wasn't he didn't have like a Christian founding. uh, He didn't have a, a base foundation of Christian understanding. 
So he wasn't really familiar with biblical teaching himself. And he never received any formal religious education either, which, of course, we're not saying that's necessary for every preacher to be formally educated in, in religion. But given his lack of any foundation of being raised in the church, he didn't have that base understanding. It would have been a, a great help if maybe kept him out of a lot of these errors. But only two years after he was supposedly converted, he was already preaching. Two years after being converted with no Christian background of any significance, he was already out preaching. Now, that's never a good idea. He was licensed to preach in the Presbyterian church. And that's a bit of a stain on their history. But to be fair to them, he flat out lied to his presbytery. that He, he said he, he received the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, for substance of doctrine. We, have a, we, we hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession, a ton of overlap with the Westminster Confession, about 90, 95% agreement at least. And he's saying, yeah, I received that as the substance of my doctrine. Those are the things I believe. Well, that's great because that makes you orthodox and trustworthy, except he was just lying. He was just lying. The truth is he hadn't even read it. And once he did read it, he was said to be shocked to discover that it contradicted much of what he believed. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's not really surprising because he formed his convictions more from legal studies. He studied uh, law and that's where he formed his convictions. He did not take it from scripture and he didn't pretend to take it from scripture either. If you read his systematic theology, especially the unabridged version, because there's, there's kind of some softened versions out there. If you read it, especially his unabridged version, you'll see he doesn't even quote scripture for the first 70 pages. And he doesn't have any detailed doctrine of scripture at all. That's not where he got his doctrine. He didn't take it from the Bible. And again, we don't, I mean, this is not meant to be a, a giant historical exposure of Charles Finney, but it is important to know where it came from. I will detail, detail to you that he literally denied the need for grace. Denied the need for grace, and flat out did it explicitly. He was a genuine Pelagian. If you don't know about Pelagianism, it's saying man can do all these things without grace. It's possible. Sometimes you need grace, but it's possible that you don't need grace at all to do any of the good that God says to do. It's perhaps, honestly, the single most condemned heresy from the very beginning of the church, the single most condemned her heresy in church history. Finney also said justification by faith alone is impossible and absurd. That's the gospel right there. Impossible and absurd. He denied penal substitutionary atonement entirely. He denied that God would impute our sins to Christ or Christ's righteousness to us. He called it a theological fiction and nonsense. He's a heretic. This man fundamentally denies the core tenets of the gospel. In fact, using his human legal theories, the whole concept of atonement was incompatible with, with his philosophy that he had developed. And which, of course, also caused him to say God would not justly give grace to some and not others. He said God could not justly condemn us for having a sin nature that we inherit. So, of course, he rejected original sin. He rejected the very fundamental thing that God says, I can give mercy and grace to whoever I want. I can have compassion on whom I have compassion. I can mercy who I have mercy on. Literally, what God says in Exodus gets repeated in Romans 9. Fundamental to the core of who God is in terms of his relationship to man. Finney said that's not true. He can't do that justly. And we could go on and on. Honestly, we could. But you will see he denied these almost all of the core fundamental doctrines taught by Christ and the apostles. And many of his objections to the gospel are really the same objections that you're going to hear from unbelievers when you explain how grace works. Now, he didn't go out and, and have these revivals and start preaching these doctrines, right? You're not going to get a lot of revivalism preaching straight up heretical doctrine like that. So he was involved with these revivals, but it's not like he was detailing his systematic theology. But what he did do was he implemented practices stemming from those beliefs. Those are the root of his practices. Because he believed those things, he implemented these practices. And that's the problem. He said this. Listen to this quote. There is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature. A revival is not a miracle or dependent on a miracle in any sense. It is just a purely philosophical result of the right use of constituted means just as a crop is the result of the right use of its appropriate means. 
That, you know what that, that means the Holy Spirit is at your disposal. God is at your beck and call in terms of you put the right things in place and God must act. Except he's saying it's not a miracle in any way. It's just that's how nature works. You do these things, you say this kind of thing, and people can't help but make a decision for Christ. It's just like you plant a seed and you water it and a crop will grow. That's how it works. Fundamentally, that's how he's saying your spiritual nature works. He does not understand how salvation worked at all, but he implemented practices based on his misunderstanding. His idea was very much the end justifies the means. If it works, then it demonstrates wisdom. If it works to get a decision for Christ, it must be a good thing. So he implemented means to get responses. He got decisions for Christ. And he got them in droves. And sadly, those same means that he put in place have been implemented by many churches since his time. He has been copied. He has set the tone of practice for far too many churches, and they're not even realizing why they're doing what they're doing. He taught that preachers need to be more spontaneous. They need to tell more stories. They need to use more human uh, humor, talk less about doctrine. In other words, what he did was he laid the foundation for seeker-sensitive churches and the entertainment model of ministry. Churches that try to get you in by entertainment and put Jesus in a corner like, hey, we'll talk about him later. Let's just have fun right now. That sort of thing. The entertainment model of ministry. He literally said religion is the work of man. Which would be consistent with his theology. If the spirit is not the one causing faith in us through regeneration, causing repentance in us, granting it to us by changing our spiritual state, then it must be of man. If the Spirit's not doing faith and repentance in us, then man is doing it to himself. He's making a decision. So Charles Finney's practices and decisional regeneration is the logical consequence of Arminian theology, and its primary product is false converts. Decisional regeneration sets the table for apostasy. Apostasy being people that once professed Christ, later denying Christ. We saw them on the video. There's guys that, and girls that we interviewed that were apostates, formerly. They, I, was, I grew up in the church. I used to profess faith, and now I don't. I don't believe it's true. That's what an apostate is. It's not a slur. It's just a, it's, it's a category of former professing Christians that are no longer professing Christians. So this decisional regeneration, these practices, it gets a reaction. That type of the, the, the means that he said to do, tell more stories, use humor, don't talk doctrine, you know, be dynamic, be spontaneous. That gets a reaction from crowds. There are no shortages of so-called decisions for Christ when you do that, but they prove to be hollow and short-lived. And he even acknowledged it himself later in his life that the conversions that he supposedly took part in, in his revivals, the ones that he was orchestrating through his natural means, he said they were only temporary. And another friend of his likewise observed all those involved in his revivals said suffered a lapse. That means they fell back into unbelief and were left like a dead coal, which could not be reignited. A coal taken out of the fire and once been cold, can't light it back on fire. That's not, I mean, that's how he described it. And that ongoing disinterest in Christ was observable literally for generations in the area. After, he, after this whole fervor and revivalism passed, that area, it was actually called the Burned Over District. It's in um, western New York, kind of northeast in general. That whole area is kind of the Burned Over District. They've had these waves of religious fervor come through with these revivals, and they experienced that in the 19th century, especially during Finney's lifetime. He was a big part of that, and it remains that way yet today, a, a very much spiritually dead area. There's little to no concern for the gospel there, sadly. Now, I know that churches are not studying Charles Finney and saying, hey, all oh, this sounds great. Let's, let's do that. Let's do what Finney did. You know, he got a lot of results. Let's try that. That's not what's happening. I, I understand that. But the issue is that they do hold to enough of his same theology, his man-centered theology, to replicate 
many of his heirs and his practices. Because like I said, his practice came from his beliefs. And his beliefs were that the Holy Spirit does not regenerate you and cause you to have faith and repentance, but rather you decide to do that. And um, American churches agree with that in large part. And so they replicate his heirs and his practices. And they've been absorbed into a lot of Arminian Baptist churches, general Baptists. They've been absorbed into generic evangelical churches. They do it by default because they believe much of what he taught about man and, and salvation. I'll say that Pado baptists those that baptize children, the, the Presbyterians and, and the like, they have something, it's different. It, it's similar in producing false converts, not out of their, their realm, but they don't do a lot of these practices um, that, that come from that. They, they kind of have like you're in by default until you decide to be out. But it doesn't come with the same practices when they when they do that, trying to get decisions for Christ. So in these general Baptist churches, in these generic evangelical churches, there's a call to get a decision to accept Christ. And that's often marked by those actions, a physical action, walking an aisle during an altar call or signing a decision card or reciting some simple prayer that a pastor dictates from the pulpit. And then they say, if you've prayed that prayer in your heart, you're saved and you've made that decision, you're saved, it's done. And then those invitations or calls for decisions just become superficial. They're, 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 they prove to be superficial and incomplete. They come with vital aspects of the gospel missing. The content of what they're telling people to get those decisions have vital aspects of the, of the gospel missing. They don't talk about repentance. They don't talk about judgment or who Christ actually is and what it even means to have faith in him. What are you having faith in him for? What are you trusting him for? What's the purpose? What, what do you mean faith in him? Believe he existed? Is that faith in Christ? No, it's not. Do, do all those making decisions for Christ know that? I, I think those making decisions very well ha, may have no idea at all what Jesus did or why he did it or who he actually was. They might look at him as a, a positive figure in general, but they don't know what actual faith in him is because that sort of thing, teaching that in depth, doesn't get a lot of decisions for Christ. I know many churches use this method because they think they're spreading the gospel when they do it, right? They think they're moving all the roadblocks, remove the doctrine that's so hard, you know, just be nice to people, make them feel good, and they'll make this decision. You know, I, I know that they're trying to spread the gospel, but in an effort to get the gospel out, they fail to get the gospel right. They get the decisions they are looking for, but those decisions do not equate to conversions. It's not people getting saved. A decision for Christ does not mean you're saved. But once they get that decision, once that happens, that moment of decision is then used to continually reassure the person of salvation. Even later in life, regardless of how they've been living. Oh no, you're saved, you made that decision. You walked that aisle. You signed that card. You prayed that prayer. You must be saved. It doesn't matter what your life looks like. You did that thing. And that has been the driving factor behind what is so often referred to as carnal Christianity. I don't know if you've heard that term. Think of it this way. False Christianity. That's what it is. People pretending to be Christians that live a life of carnality. Sin. They don't repent and change their life. When decisional regeneration is practiced on young people, for whom it is usually targeted, it racks up these youth groups full of half evangelized adolescents that are primed to abandon the church at the first sign of adversity. It is a recipe for apostasy. And that is, of course, the primary danger that comes from decision regeneration. It is the inevitable result because it is treating unconverted people as if they are converted. And unconverted people are always going to leave the faith eventually. As John said of early church apostates, the apostle John, he said, they went out from us, talking about apostates. People left the church, they went out from us, but they weren't really of us. For if they had been of us, if they really were born again, if they really were regenerated, if their faith was real, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. The reason they left the church is because they weren't actually born again. 
they were not actually saved. Their faith was not real. That's the reason they left the church. And as I always point out when I hear we read that verse, everybody from my church is probably sick of me saying this. John can't make that statement unless he believes in the perseverance of the saints. If we could lose our salvation, then he'd have to say something along the lines of, well, yeah, they used to be of us. They were really of us. They were once saved, but they changed back and they decided to no longer remain with us so that it would be shown that not everybody that, that's with us will stay of us. They, they won't all stay born again. Some of them will go back to being unregenerate. Puts, it puts your spiritual state in your own hands. Are you regenerate or not? You make the decision every day because you can switch back and forth. But that's not what John says. He says they weren't really of us. They were never born again. And the proof is, the proof that he can say that is because they left. There's one thing John knows. If you leave the church, if you leave the Christian faith, you were never born again. That's why he, that's literally what he's saying. Born again people do not leave the church. Fake Christians leave the church. And when I say leave the church, I mean leave the faith. He can't, John can't see into the hearts of the people that are leaving the church. Right? He doesn't, he doesn't have supernatural abilities to see their spiritual natures, to see that they were never born again. So he's making a theological statement that can only be made if perseverance of the saints is true. Meaning, once you've been born again by the Holy Spirit, you stay born again because it's a miracle that happens to you and Jesus keeps you alive and the Holy Spirit keeps you in the faith and he protects it and he grows it and he uses the means of grace. I'm going I'm to start ranting about that. Anyway, if you're a Christian, you stay a Christian. If you profess faith but go back to a life of sin, that shows your profession was false. It was never real to begin with. It might have felt real, might have appeared real. It's not real because true Christianity, true faith endures everything. It does not go back. Now, the last thing we want to cover is what we can expect to see, or more accurately, I would say what we are seeing from false converts due to the practices such as regeneration. First of all, we see them fall into moral relativism. They abandon scriptural authority and they start determining right or wrong on some relativistic, ill-defined standard. They don't abandon standards. It just becomes relativistic. Generally, their new standard becomes something that's emotionally determined. It, it's what makes people feel good. It wants, what makes them feel better about themselves. What makes them feel happy. Or conversely, they'll say, well, if it makes somebody feel bad, then that must be wrong. I'm not going to say what's right, but if it makes them feel bad, that's wrong. Because who are we to judge, right? Who are we to judge? That makes somebody sad. You can't say that. If it makes them sad, it must be wrong. And if, if they're doing something and it's not hurting anybody else, then why can't you just accept them for who they choose to be? I mean, did you not literally hear those words? I'm not, I'm not like, that girl is just standard fare for what we're seeing. She says, what's, what did Garrett asked her? What's one thing that I could say? Uh, love, love. And what was love to her? It was acceptance for whoever she decided to be. So biblical love becomes acceptance. By what standard? How does she know that? Says who? Accept who? Ax murderers? Pedophiles? Why not them? Why you and not them? What standard? Where's the line? It's moral relativism. It's relativistic. Those who experience decisional regeneration in their churches are left vulnerable to emotional manipulation. They react to whatever feels nicer. What feels loving? With no real standard of what love is, they just, what feels loving to them? And that's no surprise since often decisional regeneration is accomplished through emotional manipulation. That's how they got in to begin with. That's how they made their decision for Christ. They were emotionally manipulated. So it's just a continuation of the same idea. They just do the same thing. They just change how their emotions are. Emotions are always going to, they're going to go all over the place. So they just change what the emotional thing is. The church is, it's not our job to emotionally manipulate you into believing the gospel. I honestly don't care how you feel about it. I care about if you realize it's true. You can hate it, but you better believe it. If you really believe it, you'll learn to love it. I understand that. Okay, but it doesn't matter how you feel about it. 
And the truth is that emotional manipulation is much better done by the culture than the church. They're really good at it. They are really good at it. It's aided by the entire entertainment industry. Music, movies, academia, education system, all of pop culture. They can emotionally ma manipulate so much better than the church. And if it's based, if people are making their decisions on that, they're going to win. They're going to emotionally manipulate better. They can move us to tears easier than we can here. They're better at it. And it leads to moral relativism. And that always leads to self-righteousness because no one adopts a set of morals that condemns themselves. And self-righteousness always leads to damnation. Second, what we see happening is they are drawn away by sinful temptations. I've seen this. I've seen this from people that I love. You know, once professed, they get in a situation where they're like, oh, I really want to do those things. And they, they start grinding the gears. How can I justify those things I want to do? Because often the crisis point when they abandon their faith is not because they encounter some intellectual dilemma that the church hasn't addressed. That's not what actually happens. The church has addressed these intellectual problems and it has very good answers. People just don't want to hear those answers. Rather, what happens is they're tempted to pursue some sinful practice. I've got these desires welling up within me and I want to pursue them. I want to do this thing and that thing and the Bible condemns it. And now, you know what? I need to abandon my belief in scripture in order to soothe my conscience. Because they know what they're doing is wrong, according to scripture. They know that Christianity condemns that because God condemns it in scripture. They know that they're guilty if they do it. So they feel ashamed because of that guilt. And no one likes to feel shame. So they look for a reason to undermine the thing that makes them feel guilty or ma makes them guilty, which makes them feel shame. They want to undermine that so that they don't have to experience that shame. And that thing is the law of God. They have to undermine the law of God, the moral relativism thing. And it's usually driven by some desire to pursue some sin. So they reject biblical authority altogether. They affirm some form of it's not agnosticism where God hasn't spoken clearly. He hasn't revealed himself with any meaningful clarity. Did we not just see that from another guy? Is there any specific God? No, I don't think so. Is Jesus God? No. Is there a God? Yes. Is there a heaven and hell? Yes. Well, that's weird. There's a heaven and hell. There is a God. He did create. But who is it? We don't know. It's not Jesus. We don't know. How do you determine heaven and hell? Well, you got to just be good, it sounds like. That's moral relativism. Good by what standard? I don't know. God hasn't revealed himself. We don't know who God is. He hasn't revealed himself. Which God is it? We don't know. That's inevitable. That's the inevitable result. I'm not saying that to like bash these guys. I'm saying they're kind of being consistent. In other cases, what we see happening is people will retain the Christian label. There's people that we interviewed that said they were Christian. Are you Christian? Yes. And then you interview them about what that means. And they're not Christian at all. At all. But they retain that label. And what they do is they distance themselves from the church. Where do you go to church? I don't really go to a church anymore. They distance themselves from the Bible. They're not reading it. They're not adhering to it. And they do that to avoid confrontation of their sin because they know what happens when they read scripture. They know what happens when they're in a church. And that's why we find that carnal Christianity, right? Nobody's confronting them in their sin. The law of God is not being placed in front of them, telling them to live according to the commandments of God. Because imagine a professing Christian that's practicing sin. Somebody that's living in fornication, homosexuality, someone that's rampant in pornography, uh, drunkenness, people that uh, get married and divorced. People that imagine if they regularly worshiped in a biblical church and, and then they hear discomforting things when they read passages like 1 Peter 1, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the formal lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves, also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Do you think they feel good knowing their sin? No, they don't want to hear that. Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. That's the law of God. 
the will of the Father, how you should live, that's the law of God. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name? We cast out demons and in your name we perform many miracles. And he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Moral, to, moral relativism is lawlessness. You don't have a law that determines right or wrong. Or at least you, if you do, it's not God's law. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I mean, how much clearer can Jesus be? Christians obey Christ. If you have faith, you will do the things I said to do. You won't justify not living according to what I said. First John 2, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, I'm a Christian. I retain that label of Christian and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. First John 5, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Are those professing Christians, the ones that live in carnality, the ones living in sin, are they going to stay in churches when they hear those verses preached? Of course not. Why would they? They don't want to hear that. That brings that shame back. Are they going to keep reading their Bibles that are sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces them down to the soul and judges the thoughts and intents of their hearts? Are they going to stay in the Word? No. Of course not. They hear those verses and they feel that shame. Of course not. They're, they're going to go away from those things. They're going to go out from us because they were never really of us. People that are born again hear the law of God and they're... I am condemned by the law. Thank God for Jesus. Make me more like him. That's how we react. They're going to go out from us because they're not really of us. And they very well may keep calling themselves Christian. They might even find some megachurch that ignores those hard texts and entertains them every week. But carnality is still the result. False Christians care nothing for genuine holiness. That is a hallmark of a lot of people that were raised with decisional regeneration. The third thing that you see that's so damaging is inoculation to true religion. Now, what I mean by that, uh, it's what I mentioned before. A lot of the people involved with Finney's brand of revivalism lapsed back to their regular life of unbelief. They just went back to a life. They stopped being Christians, and everybody saw that happen. And the sad observation that was made even at the time when those people were left like, like I said, a dead coal which could not be reignited. They had been inoculated to true religion. These are the hardest people to reach. They become hardened against the truth, and their final state is worse than the first, honestly. Whenever someone tries to evangelize an apostate, they have the same attitude. Oh, been there, done that. Yeah, 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 I accepted Christ. Yeah, yeah, I was raised with that. I've heard it all before. That's the attitude that you get. They're not interested. Once someone goes through that whole rigmarole of supposed conversion, they brush off any real message on that subject. I'm going to keep moving fast because I know I'm taking longer than I should. Uh, the fourth thing that we see, false assurance. False assurance. Decisional regeneration sets people up for a devastating judgment day. If we love people, we want them to experience a joyous judgment day because it matters more than anything. But Decisional regeneration sets them up for just a horrific judgment day. I cannot imagine more heartbreaking words to hear than Christ telling somebody that, that considered themselves to be a Christian, that professed Christ, and yet was deceived into thinking that they were actually born again because of their decision and were constantly reassured that their, their walking of the aisle at age eight was they were saved. Oh, you're living in fornication. Oh, you're addicted to pornography and you drink all the, whatever it is. You've never gone to, you don't read the Bible. You don't pray. You don't, you're not practicing the religion itself. You're fine. You did that thing. You've made that decision. I can't imagine experiencing Christ's words, the heartbreaking words saying, I never knew you. Who are you? You've never been to my house. I've never heard you. What? You haven't read my book. You haven't heard me speaking to you through the word. I don't know. When's the last time I heard from you in prayer? I never knew you. That is horrible. The devastation that's going to come from that is just unreal. And decisional regeneration 
tricks people into thinking they're assured. And the, the, it's accompanied by those physical actions, the walking of the aisle, the, the altar calls, the signing decision cards, praying those prayers, reciting the prayers from the pulpit. And then those actions are called into service to give that false assurance to some that very well may not be saved at all. And finding out you've had a false assurance is a horrific thing in any context, but especially none greater than eternal life. Decisional regeneration has put countless thousands, perhaps millions, in a position to think that they're going to enter the kingdom of God when, in fact, they're going to be cast into hell. That's horrible. If we love people, we will do everything that we can to get them to avoid that reality. Even if they hate your message, if they think you're being a jerk, you're not accepting them, if you love them, you will barrel through the slings and arrows, the barbs of their tongue, the names that they're going to call you when you try to convert them, whatever. You're going to love them. You're going to tell them the truth about their life and what you have to do to be saved. Let them hate us. We want their judgment day to be one of joy, not of horror. Those are the only options. Fifth thing that I'll acknowledge damage to the church itself. This can only be expected because it brings in goats into the church and it keeps them around and treats them like they're sheep, right? Goats is in unbelievers, sheep is in believers, if you've ever heard that usage. Uh, we, want all, we do want unbelievers to come to the church. Of course we do. But we don't want them here to run it. <laughs> that we, we don't want the church here to cater to unbelievers. That's not what it's for. We don't want them to be the determining factor in our faith and practice within the church itself. We want them here because we want them to come to faith through the faithful preaching of the gospel. Decisional regeneration fills churches up with people that have made decisions just as it filled up those revivals in the 19th century. It, it got attention. People came. It filled up those revivals with supposed converts. But what did they do? They went out from us because they weren't really of us. And those full churches that bring people in through just decisional regeneration, they have congregations making decisions with spiritually dead minds, clouded, sinful minds. It's sort of a situation where inmates are running the asylum. They fall prey to all sorts of foolishness. They use fallen human wisdom rather than the word of God to form their worship practices and teachings. What do we teach? What do people like? Well, what do we do at church? I don't know. Let's, you know, let's have fun. What looks cool? What, who cares? They're not using scripture to, to determine what they do. And in, of course, in most cases, these churches have won converts through entertainment and, and shallow preaching. So they have to retain those people through entertainment and shallow preaching. They have to keep them happy. That's the reason they came. If you stop doing it, they're going to leave. So it damages the church because it forces them to cater to unbelievers. They have to continuously innovate, adapt, appeal to their sinful desires, whatever it is. Give them that adrenaline rush, that dopamine hit when they come on Sunday mornings and they're basically at a concert. Don't talk to them about sin. Don't tell them about repentance. All right, we've heard enough about Jesus and get them rid of that doctrine stuff. Let's, uh, let's party. Whatever it is, you know. So the worst thing is they have to keep them unoffended because any calls for repentance or any use of the law of God on saying, this is how we live our life. We're not saying do it to get saved. We're saying this is how Christians live. We're encouraging each other to do that. It's going to offend unbelievers. So they have to keep them unoffended. So they have to stay away from that content. And that's why so many of those churches are so weak on politically incorrect positions. This is why they won't preach repentance for sexual immorality or for gender identity issues or for divorce or, or fornication or for all the woke stuff that's happening. That, that is basically a direct assault on the Christian faith. Not in everything that they say, obviously, but in a lot of it. They allow Masons into the church. They tolerate divorce in the church. I know you can get divorced biblically. It's sometimes justified, but I'm saying in general, they don't make any attempts at church discipline. People get offended by that. They don't like it. So don't do it. It drives people away. We got to keep them in. They make decisions 
as a church, not based on what is true, not, not based on what the Bible tells them to do, but instead, what's going to be the least offensive? What will bring in the most people to our church? What will get the most decisions? And sadly, sometimes, what's going to keep the bills getting paid? What will get us a bigger building, more influence? What will get us more followers on social media, whatever it is? What keeps the bills, what protects this institution that we've built that everybody seems to enjoy? Now we could go on and on about this subject, and it is by no means the only cause of apostasy. Don't hear me saying that. It's not the only weakness in the American church, but it is undeniably a substantive cause, a substantial cause to the crisis of faith that so many people experience in their youth. Hard questions arise. For all of us, they do. Conviction of sin is unenjoyable for anyone. Christians don't enjoy it. We're not supposed to. But it is Christ's true sheep. Those that are regenerated by the will of God who endure through those hardships, through those hard questions, through that conviction of sin. They see the purpose in that. False Christians will fall away. And those who grew up in churches practicing decisional regeneration are left, sadly, the most susceptible to apostasy. Good churches have apostates too, obviously. We could very well have, we have 50 plus kids in this church. A lot of them profess faith at a young age. And sadly, it's almost inevitable that some of them are not really born again and they will apostatize. I hope that's not the case. I pray it's not. Good churches can have apostates. But we at least avoid much of the damage to the church that's brought on by unbelievers driving the, the practices and the beliefs of the church itself. We're not catering to them. We don't teach that salvation comes from the will of man, and therefore we don't construct our message to appeal to their desires. We don't determine what we say from our pulpits based on what people in the pews will like to hear. It's determined by the word of God. We say what's in it. They can react however they want. That's irrelevant to what it says. We're not looking for decisions. We're looking to tell the truth. We don't have to appeal to the hearts of fallen men. We'd simply leave it to the Holy Spirit to open the hearts of unbelievers to respond to the things spoken by our pastors, our teachers, our friends, those that evangelize. We leave it to the Holy Spirit. Our job is to, to tell the truth. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Your emotional reaction to that, honestly irrelevant. The emotions will come later once your mind is corrected. We tell the truth. We leave it to the Holy Spirit to do the work of regeneration. We're only here to faithfully provide the means that God has appointed for regeneration to occur. We're not trying to get those decisions. So I would say confront decisional regeneration wherever you see it, wherever you see it, and call to repentance everyone that you see living in sin, <clears throat> especially, man, especially if they are a professing Christian and they're not living like a Christian, you need to tell them you're not a Christian. That decision you made for Christ, probably false. And you're going to go out from us and you're going to hear the horrifying words of Christ, I never knew you. If you love that person, break their heart with the truth. Amen and amen.